worship as we concentrate our focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. What we'll do is we'll start with, with this side here. Has anybody got a favourite? You can just shout it out. Not all at once. 22, okay, number 22. Number 22. We are blessed, we are blessed every day of our lives. We are blessed. And let's enter into this uh, together. sing that out. Got a reason for living again, uh huh. Uh. Got a reason for laughing again, uh huh. Uh. Got a reason for loving again. I've got the love of God in my heart. <laughs> Again, you aren't very good Elvis's impersonations. So we've got a reason for living again. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Got a reason for laughing again. Just like bringing you back to camp again. I see you doing it, doing it away there, Philip. This is bringing you down memory lane. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Got a reason for living again. Uh huh.
numbers from this side. Okay, we'll switch over once. One seventy, hundred and seventy, one seven zero. I want to see Israel marching. I want to hear the trumpet call. from this evil and corrupt and wicked world and brought home into our heavenly mansion. Is there another number from this side? 179. 179. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop on that bright land where we'll never grow old. expecting you to pick that one, Philip. <laughs> Would you like to come up and sing it with me? No. <laughs> oh, he's very honest. Right, let's sing this together. I am a soldier in the army of the King of Kings. And what a wonderful privilege to be in an army that cannot lose, an army that's on the victory side, and one that is marching home to heaven. I am a soldier in the army of the King of Kings. Yeah. 
that one I don't know how you get on but I'm gonna ask Billy to come up and you know that one and so you lead us in it tonight Billy tremendous little chorus and we want to do it justice and sing it well Stand together for our opening hymn of praise. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing uh, power? And then straight after, David Cranston is going to lead us in a word of prayer.
Well, let us unite our hearts in prayer now. Let us pray together before we proceed any further. Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can enter your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. And Father, for these beautiful choruses that we've been singing together and this wonderful hymn that we have stood and sang to your praise, we thank you, Father, that we have a wonderful message tonight to proclaim. And Father, all of these great hymns and choruses point to Calvary and the point to Christ and his atoning death, shedding of his precious blood, rising from the dead, that we can be justified, that we can be set free. And Father, we realize tonight we have this message to proclaim that Jesus saves, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Lord, it's our heart's cry tonight that for those that gather in the sanctuary, realizing that they don't as yet know you as their own and personal saviour, that tonight that they would realize that they are undone that they're depraved in the sight of a holy God. But Father, we, 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 we stand tonight knowing that there's a message from all sin and a saviour from all sin, if we'll only let him in. And Lord, we plead with you tonight that you'd have your own way. We plead with you, Father, that the Holy Spirit would come and reprove and to show those folk that are unsaved their need of salvation. And Lord, for those of us who are saved tonight, we pray that we would be rejoicing, that our hearts will be filled with thankfulness, knowing that you have redeemed us and that you've saved us and you've written our names in heaven. We pray, Lord, for Alan tonight as he bears testimony to the saving grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, that your hand will be upon him. Lord, as he shows to us and points to that time when he cried unto Christ for salvation. We pray that you would go before him tonight. And Lord, later on as Samuel reads and opens your word, we thank you for this great privilege that we can come tonight corporately and to sing, to praise your name, and that we can hear your word read and expounded. We pray, Lord, that you would indeed be glorified in this gathering this evening. And Lord, later on as the youth meeting takes place, as we were praying earlier, we pray, Lord, that you would indeed help even Pastor Samuel, as he speaks again, that he'd speak well of the Saviour and young people would make that decision to follow Christ or go through with Christ. Father, we realise that this meeting bears a great weight knowing that there could be someone here tonight that could fall into a lost eternity. And Lord, our hearts are heavy and perhaps not as heavy as they should be that this is a great reality, that someone could lift their eyes being in hell, being in torments. Lord, may we, may we gather around and may we pray for those who are unsaved tonight and show us the seriousness of those who reject Christ. We pray, Lord, we just praise you for all that you've done for us. Keep your gracious hand upon us and for this meeting tonight in our Saviour's precious and ever worthy name. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate that. Do remember our youth meeting is this evening at 8.30 p.m. And you can just make your way, if you're in that category, just around our back hall. You'll be able to get some refreshments there. Then Monday is the final seminar from our fellowship on God's Amazing Book with Dr. David McCauley. This is a free seminar, half seven, and you can make your way to the back hall again on Monday evening. Tuesday is Footsteps at 10 a.m. Wednesday is our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m. And then Thursday's a board meeting at 8 p.m. Then Friday's our life planner parents evening. If you are free, then we'd love you to come along and just to support the young people as they've been practicing and training and getting prepared to reveal to you and show you everything that God has been teaching them over this past year. Then Saturday is Quest at 7.30 p.m. And then next Sunday evening, we invite you to our special Each One Reach One. And this is an opportunity for you to invite in unsaved uh, people or people who are unengaged with the gospel or even just a, a Christian friend and Jeannie Graham who sought God from the depths of an alcohol addiction and she'll be along to share with you her life story. Emma and Rachel, Emma Jane and Rachel Condy will be singing. I'll be bringing an epilogue 
There'll be refreshments after, and the children's church will also be available. Just at this point, we are delighted this evening to have Alan Coulter. I'm going to ask Alan to come and just share all that God has done for him. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, Pastor Samuel certainly knows how to put you off your Sunday dinner. But anyway, no, I'm, I'm joking. And Pastor Samuel, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to give a word of testimony. And I want to say from the very outset that I want all the glory, all the honour, all the praise to go where it belongs to the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, most of you will know me. You'll know who I am. My name's Alan Coulter. Born 1970, which leaves me a little over 40 now, I think, out in the Moy, out there, and was brought up in the village, right in the village of Moy there, and with a very happy family life. There was my sister Sharon, who is great to see here tonight, and myself, just the two of us, and my mother and father. And it, as I say, we have very happy days, a lot of very happy memories, and I'm really pleased stand here tonight I wish my mother was here but it's I'm so thrilled that she got saved and she waits in heaven to greet us again but anyway eh, during those happy times that we had in Moy they were I was growing up mostly early 80s late 70s early 80s and as most of you will remember very well there was a very dark side just under the surface and many times it came to the surface and I mean the number of times that we were moved out of our home uh, during the night during the middle of the night due to bombs bomb scares different things that happened I can remember on one occasion looking out through the window and seeing a car sitting outside the post office with the door left open and the engine still running and a bomb on board and crawling across our lamp in case the window the glass came in around us so Thankfully, it's not something that our young people nowadays really know anything about, even though it's only a very small number of years ago, really. But as I say, it, it's good that that, you know, that that side of it we don't experience now the same. But it left me, as I grew up, very conscious of death, you know, very conscious that, that, that death can come very quickly and very suddenly. And he did to many friends, friends of the family who were brutally taken away from the face of the th this earth very suddenly. You know, uh, John chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's very clear. Except a man be born again. Well, at that time, I was sent along. We belonged to a uh, Moy Church of Ireland there. Many happy days, many happy memories, and I went to the Sunday school there, and many of you will remember we beat see as we called her, uh, beat was Michael Wayne. She would have come to this church in the evenings very often with Robert. She would have sat down there. Beatsy was one of my Sunday school teachers, and um, what a great wee lady she was! What a great wee Christian woman! That uh, the influence that she had, you know, still continues with me to this day. But we had another Sunday school teacher there called Jimmy Bloomer. And Jimmy was a very successful businessman. He ran a business called Bloomer Electronics. And Jimmy, although he was very successful, no doubt quite a wealthy man, he was a saved man. And he really brought the gospel to you. He really let you know that you had to be saved. And it used to fascinate me as a young child. Jimmy had lost the top of one of his fingers. And he used to say to us, you know, boys and girls, one day, my body will be made whole again. And I just couldn't understand, you know, in the innocence of a child, how, how would he get this finger back? How would, how would this happen? But it was so true, it was so true, but Jimmy was the first man to tell me that you had to be saved to get to heaven. And for that, I will be eternally grateful to him. And I can remember him telling us this, and I can remember him telling us that if you're 
family or your friends, if you wanted to see them again in heaven, they had to be saved too. And I can remember being worried about that even. And I can remember coming to that point when he explained it to us, of getting down on my, on my knees in our own living room at home and just in a child's simple innocence praying to the Lord to save me. And I have no doubt that he did that. And, you know, that was, that was terrific. That was a young age. Now, as the, the primary school years go on, you hear a lot of people say it, it's very easy. It's very easy times. You don't have a lot to worry about. You don't have a lot to think about. You just carry on. So I did too. And in 1982, I went and moved to the Royal School in Dungannon here. Spent five years there. And through that time, I wouldn't say that I had done anything particularly bad, if you would put it like that, but just by probably simple neglect, by just getting involved in so many other things that I drifted away from the Lord. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't follow up on that faith. And then towards the end of the 1980s, I don't know if the date, the 8th of May, 1987, rings any bells for some of you older folk. I would say that it does. But I had an aunt, a sister of my mother's, who was a leader in the local Girls Friendly Society and two of her daughters, my two cousins, were young girls then and they were at members as well. And it was the night of their display. And we were on our way, the family, we were on our way to Loch Gull to see this display. And we came round a corner known locally as Hogs Corner. It's just about a mile from the village. And suddenly we heard this da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And it was machine gun fire. So what did we do? We drove closer to it. <laughs> So we came on probably another half mile and we stopped the car and we got out and it was the attack which I'm sure many of you remember on the police barracks in Loch Gall that night. It was a lovely bright early summer's evening as I remember it and eight terrorists were, were murdered, that were shot dead that night who had attacked the police station. Now at that point I would say that I was not not close to God. I had neglected so many things. I had drifted on like any human instinct. Part of me felt like this was a good thing. This, you know, these men wouldn't do this again. Just at that time, part of me felt that way, if I'm honest. And gradually over the, the weeks and months that followed that, God spoke to me and corrected me on that. You know, <coughs> sin, is the enemy of our souls. First John 5, 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I realized that despite what these men had done or were attempting to do, that they were sinners, but I was also a sinner. That God sees sin through one set of glasses, it's all sin doesn't matter what it is. Sin will drag you down no matter what it is. And I realized that and I repented of that. And through the words which you often hear quoted of King David in Psalm 51 verses 1 to 4, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And crucially, verse 4, against thee, thee only have I sinned. Sin, although it can hurt people, against a holy God, sin is so wrong. So wrong. In my late teens, I went to Lockery College in Cookstown. Did the diploma in food technology there. Got my first job then in Fane Valley in Armagh. It's now a home bargain, so I never thought I would see that. But that's where I got my first job. I worked in the laboratory there for around 12 years, 12 very happy years. Some good fellas in there, some great memories. One of them was just buried a few weeks ago, a good Christian fella called Desi Dugan, who lived up at Red Rock there. And, you know, there were some good fellas in there. But apart from that, I didn't have any real what I would call close Christian friends like we do now and you know I would say to you if you're a parent of a young child especially to everyone 
but especially to the parent of a young child, make sure you bring them to the right places. Don't complain on a Saturday night that you wanted to watch the football or you wanted to do this or that. Go that extra mile and bring them because getting them in with the right people, the right friends is just so important. It's such an influence on them. And, you know, I didn't have that and that's my fault. I don't blame anyone else for that. That's my fault. But, but I, I do say that because of that, I find myself being influenced in the wrong directions, just being influenced in the wrong ways and making bad choices, making bad decisions, going to the wrong places, neglecting God. And as Eve lost her focus and fell to temptation, so did I. And I'm ashamed to say that. It says in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, God reminded me that at that time, I thought back to that night in Loch Gaul and I remembered what had happened and I would have used the excuse very often, as I'm sure a lot of us were honest, would say, you compare yourself with other people. Well, I only did this, look what they did. Look at the big sin that they committed. I only committed a small sin. Sin is sin. Sin is sin. And it, it, it drags you down. And the, the, the shocking thing about that for me is, if the devil can get a Christian to fall, it's a very powerful weapon in his hands. It's a very powerful weapon and he can use that to give other people an excuse. I'm not going to church. I'm not going there. Sure, look what she does or he does and they say they're a Christian, this type of thing. So it can be a very powerful weapon in their hands, but I felt so bad, so low at that time. And at that time, I was drawn to the following verses. And you'll know them well in Luke 22. I don't know if you even want to look them up there. There's a few verses in Luke 22. If you have a Bible, if you want to, it doesn't matter. You can just listen. But where Peter denies knowing Jesus, Luke 22, 59 to 61. And it says, about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed saying, of a truth, this fellow was also with him for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spoke, the cock crew. And this is the crucial line. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine how Peter felt? Can you imagine the Lord turned and looked upon him? That's how I felt at that time. That's how I felt at that time. I read Luke 22, and if you look back a few verses to verse 31 and 32, just two verses where Jesus predicts Peter's denial, it says, verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when they are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Satan wanted to crush Peter, but Jesus himself assured Peter that his faith, although it would falter, would not be destroyed. It would be renewed, and he would go on to do great things for Christ. And as I reached that low point in my life, I sat down one night with my Bible and I prayed to the Lord for help and forgiveness. And he powerfully guided me to two portions of scripture. The first one is Jonah, the little book of Jonah, chapter 2. If you look at the first four verses there, it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou had cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all the billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. 
If you find yourself in that position tonight where you feel but he doesn't know or they don't know what I have done or this or that or no matter what it is, you need to know that your sin is never too great and your predicament never too difficult for God. It's never too great, no matter what it is. Romans 6, 12 to 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I knew then that I could have the victory in Jesus. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Psalm 50, 15 says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. And that's exactly what I did, asking God to cleanse me from within and to forgive me and to create in me a new heart. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Stay close to God. While I was a, when I was a little bit fitter, our children used to play a game. I'm sure I'll be corrected, but I think it was called 40-40. And you had a starting point and everybody went and hid and the idea was that you as the person who was looking for them had to go and look and when you saw them you called their name and you ran back to the post and if you got back first they were out and you won very often i was defeated but the point is staying close to the post in the first place give you a much better chance of winning the game staying close to jesus gives you a much better chance of defeating the devil and defeating sin. Stay close to him and you won't, you won't be drawn away. Stay close and pray for his help all the time. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness in Matthew 4, in verses 5 and 6, where it said, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. This is the Lord himself and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time they dash thy foot against a stone. You see in verse 6 where it says, The devil said, For it is written. He knows the word of God probably better than you do, probably better than I do. And he knows what it says. And one word can very often change a sentence. And in your head, he can very often play with your mind, twist the truth, and lead you away. We must pray to God for a covering of the blood. Well, I can't give my testimony without saying, in the year 2000, I was happily married to Valerie here. It's a long time ago now. It doesn't feel that long. <laughs> But we've been blessed with four healthy children and I'm just privileged to say that they're all saved. Valerie and I both teach in Sunday school here and what a privilege that is, you know, to bring that message. Sunday school is very special to me because of the reasons that I have told you. It's very special to me and I find it such a privilege to try to, to bring that message, to be used to bring that message, not that it's anything of me, but it's, it's bringing, presenting the Lord Jesus to the children and, and telling them the truth in days that are so full of evil. Briefly, we all go through pain in our lives. Um, there were two very difficult times just to mention them. Um, the first one for us was when we lost our first child. And the second one was when our oldest girl was taken very ill. And I can say, as I said to you earlier, about the importance of Christian friends, about the importance of Christian influence in your life, and not least in this place where we prayed for, sincerely prayed for, and lifted up. And, you know, I couldn't put into words what that meant. 
I couldn't put into words how those very, very difficult days in our lives that we went through were you just so felt the presence of God, you so felt a peace in your heart, even in the most difficult times when you know you're hurting and it will happen, but God's in control of it. It's not taking him by surprise, it's taking you by surprise. He is faithful and he was faithful to me even when I wasn't. Hebrews, I'm just finished. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When God makes a promise to tell this to the children all the time, he keeps it. When we make a promise, we maybe do our best to keep it, but it doesn't always happen. Not so with him. I want to finish with just two verses, and with this I do finish. They're found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. It says this, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honour, and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I thank God for his faithfulness to me in my life when I was so unfaithful to him. And where he is brought me and what he has given me I could never thank him enough um, I do look forward to walking those streets of gold and I can tell you sincerely that every one of you in this sanctuary I don't want us ever to say did you see so and so put your name in there are they not here where are they I haven't seen them don't want that to happen I want every one of you to be there with us to celebrate together and spend eternity before God's throne, giving him all the glory and all the honour and all the praise. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Alan. We really appreciate you just laying your heart open to us this evening. I'm going to bring you very quickly to another testimony, to another life story, and it's found in the little book of Philemon. Now it's, it's squashed between Titus and the book of Hebrews and if you'd like to turn to, with, with me to that little book, it's just 25 verses between Titus and Hebrews, little epistle to Philemon. Now Paul, a little bit of the context, Paul he has written this letter to a wealthy friend called Philemon, he's a businessman. Philemon had a slave called Onesimus. And when Nisimus had stolen from him and taken off for the bright lights of Rome, and yet in the providence of God, he mysteriously comes into contact with this mighty man of God called Paul. Paul was in Rome as a prisoner, and consequently, when Nisimus becomes a Christian. And therefore, uh, Paul sent him back to Philemon with this letter, which we have now in our New Testament. And Paul's request is really simple, that Philemon would forgive Onesimus and receive him back as a brother. In verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departest, departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own besides. Lord, lad, his blessing to the reading of his word. I just want to see a few little themes from this passage and I trust it'll apply it then to our hearts. Firstly, every Christian was once a slave and on the run. Every Christian was once a slave and on the run. Now it's estimated that there were around 600,000 slaves in the Roman Empire. And the word slave just means someone who is the legal property of another. Not only, but someone who has no freedom or no personal rights. Someone 
quite like this slave Onesimus. In total, he was the property of Philemon. How Onesimus became a slave, we're not sure. Maybe he was an orphan. Maybe he grew up with no belongings. Maybe he sold himself as a slave or servant to this well-to-do gentleman called Philemon in hope that Philemon would look after him. Maybe he was a captured rebel who was branded with this name Onesimus, which means useless. Maybe he was sold at auction. And Philemon, he needed a slave and he, he bought useless because no one else would. But this we know that Onesimus was the legal property of this wealthy businessman called Philemon. But in a much wider context, Philemon was a slave. The legal property to someone else. To Satan and to sin. And Alan has so rightly reminded us this evening that we are born with our hearts turned, to, turned against God. That King David could say, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That we were all born haters of God. We naturally hated God. We wanted nothing to do with him. We want to march to our own drumbeat. And there's nothing we can do ourselves to reform our sinful and our wicked hearts. I remember talking to an individual on the street one day in Portadown. He was unsaved. And he told me he could reform himself. That he could quit the cigarettes. That he could quit the drink. And I remember telling him, Satan can't reform Satan. Only the Savior can reform a satanic life. You need a greater power to deliver you. You need the power of Almighty God. And Donald McLeod says we will never appreciate all that God has done for us until we understand the mess we were in. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. We are so glad that you've come. But you are dead in trespasses and sin. And think of something dead. They're unresponsive. They're not sick, but they're dead. And there's nothing you can do to change your, your situation before God. You need the power of the Holy Ghost uh, to change your position. All of us then in this building were once like one Nisima. Runaway slaves and sinners. We're running, as Alan once said, running from our rightful owner God. Secondly, every Christian's guilt was great and their penalty was severe. Well, when this emus, he was in big trouble. He was guilty of two capital crimes. Guilty of firstly, leaving his master and secondly, theft. If he had been caught, the least he would have been branded with a hot iron in his forehead fugitive or with the letter cv beware the thief but most likely instead of being stamped on the head onesimus would have lost his head but here is onesimus he's maybe a down and out maybe lying on the streets of rome he's homeless and he's recalling his fugitive journey maybe his mind flashes back to that minute that he he put his hand into his master's wallet and took a fistful of cash Maybe his mind turned to taking a boat to Ephesus where he purchased some handsome clothing. Maybe he came out of the shop thinking no one will know me as a slave but a well-to-do man of the road. And here he is as he's replaying his journey to Rome where the historian said all things horrible and disgraceful find their way there. And here is Onesimus he tries to fade into the dark world as a fugitive but now he's perhaps lying on the street with his money parted. The freedom he'd hoped for was tarnished with guilt, with bondage, and with fear. And is that not what sin does to us? Some time ago, there was an individual came to me with tears in their eyes. They had run from God for years, and they just said, I want peace from my guilty conscience. Every night I, I sit in bed and the, the, the guilt and the condemnation that weighs heavy upon my mind. And maybe that's you. Well, Christ can give you a brand new start. If any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creation. All things are passed away and all things become brand new. I think when Nisimus had found what James Dobson said, the grass on the other side is often not greener. And it's often not edible. That there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
Thirdly, every Christian experienced grace that in turn turned the tables on their judgment. When this he missed, the slave had experienced the grace of God. You ask me this evening, what is the grace of God? It is the undeserved, uh, undeserved goodness and favour of God to mankind. Alan does not deserve to be standing here. It's only the goodness of God that saves us and all of his grace. It should be no surprise that none of us deserve to be in the family of God. None of us deserve to call God our Father. That's why Paul could write in, in Ephesians chapter 2, it's for by grace are you saved. It is because God has lavished his love upon us that Jesus stepped down to pay our sin debt. It was Robert Louis Stevenson who was the author of of Treasure Island said, there is nothing but God's grace. We walk upon it, we breathe it, we live it, we die it. It is the nails and axles of our universe. And somehow here is Onesimus, he has ran from Philemon right into the providence of God. And Onesimus must pay back what he owes. And Paul writes in verse 18, if he hath wronged thee, or he oweth thee all, Put that on mine account. Another rendering of verse 18 is this. Chalk it down to me. If one this he misses stolen, chalk it down to my account. I'll foot the bill. I'll let him go free. What is Paul doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's being like Jesus. He is modelling Jesus. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, our sins was put on his account. They were chalked down to him. That he was treated how I should have been treated. He paid the debt that I was due. And when I trust him as my saviour, this divine righteousness is put on my account. And God now accepts me in Jesus Christ. Jesus says to the Father, when you trust him, and when you repent, he no longer owes you. Your debt is paid because I paid it fully on the cross. Receive him as you would receive me. Let him come into the family circle. You see, the wonderful message of the gospel is this, that he who knew no sin became sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Paul takes the pen from the secretary and he says, whatever one Nisimus owes in verse 19, I've written it with my own hand. This is the first check ever written. Chalk it down to me. However, Jesus paid for our sin with his own hand when they cruelly nailed the Son of God to a cross and he hung on our behalf. And I just wonder tonight, maybe you're in a backslidden condition. Maybe you're dressed up, but your heart is so far from God that if your life was put in this back screen, you would crawl underneath the pew. But I tell you what, God sees it. And he knows all about it. And tonight there's pardon. There's forgiveness for the backslider. There's forgiveness for the fugitive, for the one who's wronged God. And you can be made right tonight. Fifthly, our rightful owner accepts us back and adopts us into his family. I like to think of Onesimus returning to Philemon with this letter. And Philemon, this wealthy businessman, has this letter on his lap. And as he reads it, he gets up and perhaps he throws his arms around Onesimus and he adopts him not as a servant, not as a slave, but a brother into his family. Onesimus has a brand new relationship with Philemon. And likewise, if you're here and you're living in open sin, secret sin, if you but repent this evening, you will enter into this new relationship with God. My every day, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to start the day off and say, My Father, which art in heaven. To know that relationship with God. Do you have it? To know that God is no longer hostile and angry towards our sin. That we have received the spirit of adoption that we can cry, Abba, Father. And so one this he must, must forget the past. And so must we who are in Christ. And put our hand into the hand of Christ. 
and run the race. Picture the scene in a local market in the ancient, ancient Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Two men talking. The market, can you hear the conversation? I heard the news that Onesimus, useless, the slave, took a chunk of Philemon's <coughs> wealth and ran away. And the other man says, well, I wouldn't expect any better from a slave, especially from useless, especially from Onesimus. And then some time passes and there's another conversation sparked up in the market. I thought you said Onesimus had ran away from Philemon. I thought he was nowhere to be seen. The other man says, well, what did you see? Well, he said, I was at one of those house meetings that Philemon was holding. And Onesimus was there, the runaway slave. And he's talking about the grace and goodness of God. And he's worshipping God. And he's singing the praises of the forgiveness of God. And he's saying, I'm no longer a slave, but I'm a child of God. What a wonderful testimony. And that can be your story tonight. No longer a slave to sin, but a child of God. The reality is there are only two kinds of slaves that are hearing this message. The first are those who have stopped running like Alan, like many others in this building, have found rest, have found refreshment in this new life of Christ. The second are those who may be dressed up, who may look the part in this meeting, but their heart is running from God, running from the horrible consequences of sin, running from the forgiveness and freedom available right now. My prayer for you, and it has been a prayer, if that is your situation, is that the grace that has changed my life you will allow Jesus Christ to free your life. My prayer is to those who have been freed by God's amazing grace then, is that you will be useful to your master. That you will live out your redemption. That you will submit yourself as a servant to God in this incoming week. That you might let, light your, let, 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 let your light shine in the office, in the home, because you're no longer a slave but you're a child of the living God. Are you running from God? Or has there been a moment that you've run to God? If you're not yet a Christian, but you're a backslidden, wouldn't tonight be a wonderful night when you come and embrace the forgiving power of the Lord Jesus Christ? Thank you for listening. Let us join together for our final hymn of praise and worship. Can I say we are always here to talk with you? If we can speak with you not only here in the church or perhaps call out to your home, then please reach out to us. We'd be too glad to speak to you. O Christ in thee, my soul hath found and found in thee alone. Let's just sing the first three verses, standing uh, together to sing.
Father, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the power of a changed life. We thank you for the evidence that you can do a, a good job in a life. We thank you, O oh God, to know freedom from sin. We know to have that home in heaven. And O oh God, we pray for one this evening that may be playing, God, playing games with their creator, that in their own heart they're far from you. O oh God, we pray as you see their heart, as you peer through the ceiling of this church, that you will help them to be honest before you. And if there is a strained heart, a wandering heart, they might say, Thou God seest me. And like David say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We know the day is coming when all things will be made naked before your eyes. We will give an account of ourselves before God. O God, we pray, there would not be one in our building whose heart is far from you that would not, that would never hear the cry to be called up, but would hear the call that they're caught on. O God, have mercy. We pray, Lord, even this evening from one in, in Magashal who's not in our meeting, that the Spirit of God would strive with them and bring them to an understanding of their need. Help those of us that are saved to live out our faith as that beacon of hope. We know the gospel is all the answers for today's problems. And help us not to treasure it, treasure it ourselves, but help us to declare with others that Jesus Christ and him alone is where our worth can be found. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. We do sincerely thank you for coming this evening. We really do appreciate it. Our little cards are on the hall table again. Each one, reach one. Would you take one in your load out? Think of one person this incoming week, you can hand one of these two and then pray that God will undertake. Thank you again.